Travels of Marco Polo, Chapter 18, of the City of Kamandu and the District of Rio Barlet, of certain birds found there, a peculiar kind of oxen, and a tribe of robbers. At the end of the desert of this mountain, you arrive at a plain that extends in a southern direction to the distance of five days' journey. At the commencement of this, there is a town named Kamandu, Kamadin, formerly a very large place, and of much consequence, but not so at this day, having been repeatedly laid waste by the Tartars. The neighboring district is called Rio Barlet, Rudbar. The temperature of this plain is very warm. It produces wheat, rice, and other grains. On that part of it, which lies nearest the hills, dates, pomegranates, quinces, and a variety of other fruits grow, among which is one called Adam's apple, which is unknown in our cool climate. Turtle doves are found here in vast numbers, attracted by the plenty of small fruits, but they are not eaten by the Mahometans, who abominate them. There are likewise many pheasants, and francolins, the kind of partridge, which latter do not resemble those of other countries, their color being a mixture of white and black with red legs and beak. Also among the cattle, there are some of an uncommon kind, particularly a species of large white auction, the zebu, with short, smooth coats, the effect of a hot climate, horns short, thick, and obtuse, and having between the shoulders a gibbous rising, or hump, about the height of two palms. They are beautiful animals, and being very strong and carry great weights. When loading, they are accustomed to kneel down like the camel, and then to rise up with the burden. We also find here sheep that are equal to an ass in size, with long, thick tails weighing 30 pounds and upwards, which are fat and excellent to eat. In this province, there are many towns surrounded by lofty and thick walls of earth for the purpose of defending the inhabitants against the incursions of the Karunas, who scour the country and plunder everything within their reach. In order that the reader may understand who these people are, it is necessary to mention that there was a prince named Nugadar, probably Nigudar, the nephew of Chakatai, a son of Genghis Khan, who was brother of the great Khan Ogodai, and reigned in Turkestan. This Nugudar, while living at the Chagatai's court, became ambitious of being himself a sovereign, having heard that in India there was a province called Malabar, governed at that time by a king named Asadin Sultan, which had not yet been brought under the dominion of the Tartars, he secretly collected a body of about 10,000 men, the most profligate and desperate he could find, and leaving his uncle without giving him any hint of his intentions, proceeded through Balashan, Badakshan, to the kingdom of Kesmur, Kashmir, where he lost many of his people and cattle from the difficulty and badness of the roads, and at length entered the province of Malabar. Coming thus upon Asadin by surprise, he took from him by force a city called Delhi, as well as many others in his vicinity, and there began to reign. The Tartars, whom he carried thither, and who were men of light complexion, mixing with the dark Indian women, produced the race to whom the name of Karaunas is given, signifying in the language of the country a mixed breed, and these are the people who have since been in the habit of committing depredations, not only in the country of Rio Barla, but in every other to which they have access. In India, they acquired the knowledge of magical and diabolical arts, by means of which they are able to reduce darkness, obscuring the light of day to such a degree that persons are invisible to each other unless they are close together. Whenever they go on their predatory excursions, they put this art into practice, and their approach is consequently not perceived. This district is the most frequent scene of their operations, because when merchants assemble at Ormus, Hormuz, and wait for those who are coming from India, they arrange in winter to send their horses and mules, which are out of condition from the length of their journey, to the plain of Rio Barla, where they find abundance of pasture and become fat. The Karaunas, aware that this will take place, seize the opportunity for a general pillage and make slaves of the people who attend the cattle, if they have not the means of ransom. Marco Polo himself was once enveloped in the darkness of this kind, but escaped from it to the castle of Consalmi. Many of his companions, however, were taken and sold, and others were put to death. Chapter 19 of the City of Ormos and the Hot Wind that Blows There At the end of the plain mentioned before, as extending in a southern direction to a distance of five days' journey, there is a descent for about twenty miles by a road that is extremely dangerous because of the multitude of robbers by whom travelers are continually assaulted and plundered. This downward path conducts you to another plain, very beautiful in appearance, two days' journey in extent, which is called the Plain of Ormos. Here you cross a number of fine streams and see a country covered with date palms, among which are found the Frankel and Partridge, birds of the parrot kind, and a variety of others unknown to our climate. At length you reach the border of the ocean, where upon an island at no great distance from the shore stands a city named Ormos, whose port is frequented by traders from all parts of India. These bring spices and drugs, precious stones, pearls, gold cloth, elephant's tusks, and various other articles of merchandise. These they dispose of to other traders by whom they are distributed throughout the world. This city, indeed, is essentially commercial, has towns and castles dependent upon it, and is esteemed in the principal place in the kingdom of Kerman. Its ruler is Rukmadin Akomak, who governs with 
absolute authority, but at the same time acknowledges the king of Kerman as his liege lord. When any foreign merchant happens to die within his jurisdiction, he confiscates his property and deposits it in his treasury. During the summer season, the inhabitants do not remain in the city on account of the excessive heat, which renders the air unwholesome, but retire to their gardens along the shore or on the banks of the river, where with a kind of austere work, they construct huts over the water. These they enclose with stakes driven into the water on one side and into the shore on the other, making a covering of leaves to shelter from the sun. Here they stay during the period in which there blows every day from about nine till noon, a land wind so intensely hot as to hinder breathing and suffocate the person exposed to it. No one overtaken by it on the sandy plain can escape from its effects. As soon as the approach of the wind is noted by the inhabitants, they immense themselves to the chin in water and continue thus until it ceases to blow. In proof of the extraordinary degree of this heat, Marco Polo says that he happened to be in these parts when the following occurred. The ruler of Ormus, having neglected to pay his tribute to the king of Kerman, the latter decided to enforce it at the season when the principal inhabitants are away from the city, upon the mainland, and for this purpose dispatched 1,600 horsemen and 5,000 foot soldiers through the country of Rio Barla in order to take them by surprise. In consequence, however, of being misled by the guides, they failed to arrive at their goal before nightfall, and halted to rest in a grove not far from Ormos. But upon recommencing their march in the morning, they were assailed by this hot wind and were all suffocated not one escaping to carry the fatal news to his master. When the people of Ormus learned of this, and went to bury the carcasses in order that their stench might not affect the air, they found them so baked by the intensity of the heat, that the limbs, upon being handled, separated from the trunks, and it became necessary to dig the graves close to the spot where the bodies lay. The vessels built at Ormus are of the worst kind and dangerous for navigation, exposing the merchants and others who use them to great hazards. Their defects result from the failure to use nails in the construction because the wood is of too hard a quality, and is liable to split or crack like earthenware. When an attempt is made to drive a nail into it, it rebounds and is frequently broken. The planks are therefore bored as carefully as possible with an iron auger near the end. Wooden pins or trend nails are then driven into them, and they are in this way fastened. After this, they are bound, or rather sewed together, with a kind of rope yarn stripped from the husk of the Indian nuts, coconuts, which are large and are covered with a fibrous stuff like horsehair, this being steeped in water until the softer parts putrefy. The threads or strings remain, and of these they make a twine, which lasts long underwater, for sewing the planks. Pitch is not used for preserving the bottoms of the vessels, but they are smeared with an oil made from the fat of fish, and then caulked with aquum. The vessel has no more than one mast, one helm, and one deck. When she is taken in her cargo, it is covered over with hides, and upon these they place the horses which they carry to India. They have no iron anchors, but instead employ another kind of ground tackle, the consequence of which is that in bad weather, and these seas are very trepestuous, the ships are frequently driven on shore and lost. The inhabitants of the place are of a dark color and are Mahometans. They sow their wheat, rice, and other grain in the month of November, and reap their harvest in March. They also gather fruits in that month, with the exception of dates, which are collected in May. Out of these, along with other ingredients, they make a good kind of wine. When, however, it is drunken by persons not accustomed to it, it causes an immediate flux, diarrhea. But upon their recovering from its first effects, it proves beneficial to them and helps make them fat. The food of the natives is different from ours, for were they to eat wheat and bread and meat, their health would be injured. They live chiefly upon dates and salted fish, such as the tunny, sipple, and others which from experience they know to be wholesome. Excepting in marshy places, the soil of this country is not covered with grass because of the extreme heat, which burns up everything. Upon the death of men of rank, their wives loudly bewail them once each day for four successive weeks. There are also people here who make such lamentations a profession, and are paid for uttering them over the corpses of Persians to whom they are not related. Having spoken of Ormus, I shall for the present defer treating of India, intending to make it the subject of a separate book, and now return to Kerman in a northly direction. Leaving Ormus, therefore, and taking different roads to that place, you enter upon a beautiful plain producing in abundance every article of food, and birds are numerous, especially partridges. But the bread made from wheat grown in that country cannot be eaten by those who have not accustomed their palates to it, having a bitter taste derived from the waters, which are all bitter and salty. On every side you perceive warm, healing streams, good for the cure of skin ailments and other complaints. Dates and other fruits are very plentiful. 